Oh, Blackpool Live. We're here, aren't we, Johnny? All right. Yeah. What is that on your face? My, my, my lip, it, my bit of makeup for the show. We've got Graham Wesley. You're missing some there. we go. What do you think? Perfect. You look like a young uh, Keith Lemon. Let's talk through his clubs. Rob, Stevenage, Preston, Peterborough, Newport. Anybody else? He's not bothered, he just wants to get dressed up. Let, let us know when you're finished. That's actually the best I've ever seen him look. What are your favourite managers, John? You've had a lot to say in the past. Oh, you've had, a, you've had a lot to say about in the past about Graham. So I'm looking forward to you giving it to him. You know exactly what's going to happen. He'll come in, he'll test him out, and I'll shit my fans. They are right, aren't they? Right, come on, we're all on stage. We're ready to go. Wrexham coming soon. And also, massive thanks to Fair Play sponsoring the rest of the series. We'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. Come on. Actually, before we start, do we, do we call you Graham or do you want us to call you medal winner? <laughs> <laughs> I, think before we, I think before we start, we should get on to Parky, don't you? Yeah, I yeah think, I absolutely. Think we, I think Take the reins, Graham. Uh, Take the reins. There's an, there's an elephant in every room. Does everybody want a coffee? <laughs> <laughs> we're going to need a fucking big apple. <laughs> there's an elephant in every room. I checked it. It was 2018 where the the Newport or the Southwest Argus reported that Parky was bringing a book out. So I read through this. I thought it doesn't sound like what happened between me and Parky. It doesn't it doesn't sound a bit like what happened between me and Parky. And then I went back to my phone and I went, hang on a minute, what was that text Parky sent me? Dear Graham, thanks so much for what you've done for me. When you came in, I I made it my business. I'm my own man. I make my own mind up about you, but. Different man from the one I thought you were going to be. You know, thanks for what you've done for me, my son. Let me go back to York. Da 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 da. da. Best wish for the future, Parky. I'm like, what a good guy. I got him. <laughs> what a good guy. <laughs> Scored a great goal for me against Plymouth. <laughs> Uh, but to be fair, I've been good. I'd, I'd come in, I'd recognise that you weren't going to press from the front with Parky. So I've got a nice little roll for him at 10. Just stand still out of possession, Parky. Just receive the ball in, get us, get us playing, hold the ball up, bring others into play, get yourself in the box late, score from the edge of the box. Just do that. I'll do that. He got a hamstring injury first game. So I think he did try and make one covering run. And, <laughs> and then, so I've got the text on the one hand and I've got the book on the other. And I thought, elephant in the room, let's get it on the table. What is it? Is it the book or is it the text that we should be believing? I had to try and sell as many as I could, Graham. Uh, so, no, I, I'll be honest with you, right? When he first came in, I thought, this guy's not for me, right? From what I've heard from, uh, from Ram Football. So I thought, I will give you the benefit of the doubt. Uh, and as a fella, I think you're good as gold. But I just could not do your training. I could, I just physically couldn't do it with the age I were, my knee, and I was, I was fucked. So that's why I needed to... And in your defence, you always wanted to be close to Oliver, didn't you? Wherever, whichever club you were playing yeah. for. <clears throat> I will leave it out at eight and I will get in at six and I was just going home and I was just getting in bed. I got no life and I like my life. So, yeah, so that's. Glad we've cleared that up. Are you? I think, I think it was clear anyway. The minute I read the text, <laughs> <laughs> you've got to sell books. You've got to sell books. You've got to have stories when you're doing your after dinner. You've got, you've, got to sell, you've got to have stories when you're doing your after dinner. So I was, I was fine with it. I thought, whatever, whatever. <laughs> I listened. The, re the reason I'm here is because I listened last week to Lady. Yep. Someone sent it to me and said, you want to have a listen to this lady? It's like with these, with these guys. And uh, so I listened to Lady, and he was putting a couple of things out there about Wesley. Wesley, he calls me, he called me Gaffer all his life, Lady. Lady, he's suddenly Wesley. <laughs> I'm like, what? And then he tells a story. He goes, um, Wesley, he, he's like out of the blue. Well, this is what he's like. He'd text you out of the blue, like FaceTime from, from like my yacht in the south of France. I mean, no one I haven't got a yacht in the south of France, so I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> but the second thing is, the context is important, yeah? So context. Lady texts me to say, Gaffer, how are you doing? Like, you know, thinking of you the other day, saw this, saw that, saw this, read this, you know, um, hope everything's great, hope life's good. At which point I go, oh, lady, nice text coming. I was on a yacht probably. 
<laughs> so I FaceTime Lady in response to his text to go, Lady, uh, how am I doing? That's how I'm doing. <laughs> and I put it down. And then all of a sudden, Lady's in there going, I'll tell you what he's like. <laughs> Blue, he FaceTimes and goes, look at me. I don't think so, Scotty, but he's a lovely lad. I love him. To be fair, he changed my opinion of you. Of me? Yeah. yeah. I think. What was your opinion? And what was just your from on? just from stories that we from lads that we've had on here, and the, I don't know if it's a myth about normal working hours. The the training ground from nine to five. I've heard the texting one, texting about what team do you think I should pick, or which I did find funny some of them. Mm -hmm. um, and then when Lady was on, I kind of thought, I bet you once you're in and you get the norm, he's good to work for. It's just the other stories that probably from lads that. Say we've had Ian Hume on, who was part of the, what's he called? The thingy nine. Yeah, the boxing crew. The boxing crew. Yeah. Um, which I'm sure we will, we'll talk about. But I just thought, if you get the norm, I bet you he's good to work for. I think every story you hear about anyone, you should always get a little bit of the context, shouldn't you? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, you, you talk there about, um, say that boxing, the, you know, the boxing scenario. I was talking to, Parky off air about um, Preston. And I was talking about like the job you get given by a football club. Preston, when I went in there, was um, really clear. Like they'd come down from the championship, budget was that big. In the championship, your money drops that much. And the club needed, I think at the time, with respect to, to um, the late Mr. Hemmings, um, you know, he'd had some publicized difficulties, you know, in, in the business world. And the club needed to like cut his cloth. So I came in at a time where the budget had to do that. So some of the big hitters in there, whether I like them or not as players, people, another matter, whether I like them or not as players, they were going to have to leave the football club. And my way of dealing with players in those circumstances has always been very straightforward. Like I'm not going to, I'm not going to dance around things. I'll sit down with people and say, listen, Brownie, you're on X pounds a week. Our budget's going from that to that. There is no room for you going forward. So we're going to have to work out an answer. You're going to have to move on. It's not about whether I fancy you as a player. It's not about whether you fit into my style of play. It's not about whether you are going to fancy my training regime. Nothing like that. You're just going to have to move on because the economics of the situation depend on it, uh, demand it. So, you know, I've, I've had situations like that. And the player isn't always amenable to what you're saying to him. The player doesn't always want to, you know, move on. They love the club. They want to stay at the club. They see you as the manager as the problem. But... You know, when I'm having those conversations with people, I'm not the problem. Like, the, the problem is the club's been relegated. The problem is the budget's not there. The problem is the wages are too big. The problem is you're going to have to move on. So you can end up, you know, at war with a player um, because, you know, dealing with it openly and honestly um, doesn't get you, the, you know, what you're looking for. So, yeah, I think you've got to understand sometimes context around things that happen in football, in life, you know. I th I've been vocal about... You know, when a player's out of favour, you're trying to move them on. I've said on here loads of times that I think not letting them train with a group affects everything. Affects the, the group that you want at the club. Yeah. Affects, the, obviously, the lads that aren't part of the group. And it just creates a bad atmosphere. Yeah. How, how do you look back on that? Because I know, I can't remember the name. There was something, there's something six where they just weren't allowed yeah, to train. I can't remember the name, but no. What how do you look about, back yeah. on that? And can you say why sometimes you think it might affect the lads no, that I you think, want at the club? I think that was a that was a slightly... In that situation, um, it, it was slightly different, as in we'd got to the end of a season, um, a, you know, a certain group of lads, for one reason or other, were going to move on. I think some of the lads who were in that group were um, young lads who bids had come in. They were going to leave the club. They weren't going to be part of the group for that season. Um an example, I might be wrong, but I think Danny Mayer was in that group and I think he was, you know, we knew he was going to Swansea at the time. Um, you needed to work on Danny and work with Danny, mm. but what a player. He could make things happen. So he's a manager's dream. You know, there's no way you'd want to ostracise him, but he wasn't going to be part of the group. He was going to be leaving the club. So the, the lads who went um, to the boxing uh, place, and I mean, well, they weren't there for boxing, they were there for fitness. It was pre-season. It was somewhere for them to train. There was a good coach there. He was going to do a bit of work with them, keep them fit while they went off. In Hume's case, he went there, but he was, he was on his way out. Um, he went to Donny, I think, at the time. Yeah. And... Um, you know, we knew we knew someone was going to take Ian Hume. It was a financial decision. It wasn't a player decision. I remember before I took the job at Preston, going and watching a Friday night game. Um, we were playing. I was at Stevenage at the time. We were playing up here. Preston were playing at home against Yeovil. 
And they won 4-3, played with the diamond, Phil was in charge, and Hume played at the top of the diamond. What a, what a player. I mean, just you watched Hume that night and thought, like, I'd come up from League Two with Stevenage, I was fearing playing Hume. I mean, he ran the show. They scored four, could have been 10, and... Uh, you know, he, was a, he would be a joy to work with. But you come in, you know you've got to cut your budget. He's a championship player and in championship money. With respect, I'm not going to talk about the detail of that. But, you know, and he had to go. So, um, yes, yeah, listen, difficult things happen and people's perception of it is what it is. Um, but, you know, the, do, do I think it's right to ostracise people? Not at all. But if you're building, you're trying to build a squad, you'll know you can't build a squad with 45 people on the training ground. So if there's half a dozen who are going to be leaving, putting them to one side, being respectful to them and saying, look, guys, you know what the situation is. You know you're not going to be here. You know I've got to try and get this group together. You know, I'm going to have to, like, find you an arrangement so you fit wherever you go. Um, I think that's a respectful way of handling people if you're all, if you're all grown up about it. Because we had a, a couple of years before you were at Preston because Darren Ferguson came in. Can you remember? Yeah. And it was exactly the same situation. And the lads that were in the group, that he made a changing room for the lads that he didn't want to keep at the club. They were, they were friends, they were well-respected pros, sure. and it just created, a, it was a horrible atmosphere, yeah. wasn't it? it? Yeah, it weren't nice. For so that's, were that's why I, I always say, I just don't think anything good can come out of it. I mm. think maybe you can still get people out of the club without having to do that. But yeah. I suppose from a manager's perspective, if you're under pressure as well, in this is the team that you've got to deal with, they've got to go from the club. Yeah. Like and, you said, do I need to push that to a side? And concentrate on the job that yeah, I've do, got. I enough. do think, though, that it, even though I take what you're saying, hundred um, percent, and being at Preston wouldn't teach me that. Like you know, whatever level you've played, I played professionally for a short period before I moved into business. Um, but I've played a lot of football, and whether you're playing, you know, in the in the Ryman League, whether you're playing in League One, whether you're playing at the top level, we've all been in dressing rooms. People are people. Players are players. We're all the same. Yeah, and. Nobody wants to see people that they respect, are friendly with, being treated badly. I've been, I've been that player. I remember yeah. in, in non-league football being forced out of a club by a manager who made me turn up for the reserves. I'd been top goal scorer for the club for two years. Uh, first game of the following season, you're in the reserves. Yeah, I'm in the reserves. What's that all about? A bid had come in for me. He wanted me to go. He wanted the money in. So you're with the reserves. Not only was I with the reserves, I was sub for the reserves. So you can imagine, like me, being sub for the reserves. I, I, let, I remember leaving the game. I stayed for the game. I did what I was required to do. I stayed for the game. I didn't get on. I went back to the ground, fronted the manager. I was in his office, having it out with him. That was not a good way of handling me. I was a character who would go into the dressing room, talk to my mates. Like, the lads who were in the dressing room were playing in the first team. Like, were not on board with that. There's a, that's a disrespectful way of dealing with this guy. Um, and it was disrespectful. And I would never treat a human being like that. I think human beings need to be given respect and but change does have to happen as well no two situations are the same no two player individual player situations so i think you've got to talk to people and got to work things through you go back to man management you've got to talk you talk with the individual about the individual and see what the various scenarios are england australia this week yeah and we've got our new partnership with fair play which we mentioned at the beginning and i like this up I think we were working with them because of the ethics around it. Do you know what I like about it? There's always one of your mates that never got any cash. Yeah. And he's always first to say, I'll have a fiver with you. Well, funny enough, well, you've in, got no money. In this corporation, there's, I've got three of my mates, <laughs> three out of four who've never got no cash on them. So it's not just, it's not just one in this, in this uh, thing. <laughs> but that's the thing, there's no bookie and they don't take any commission or anything. It's just about, it's just a platform for you and your mates to have a bet between each other. It's so quick as well, isn't it? Yeah. 20 seconds worth. Have a, having a game of FIFA, game of golf, let's have a fiver on this that's who, one, for a winner. It? If you want to play with your mates, like FIFA, for instance, I'll have a five over here. Boom, put it in. Put your five yeah. on. Yeah, because there's always people that give it the big in, aren't they? I tell you what, this could take up a notch. I give off. Yeah. In the taxi, last First one, one get out. out the taxi. A five in. And... Oh, there's money on the line now. I just, I just give mine, lads. You know, I'm not good at the old Eggie Boff. <laughs> so this one, we've gone England to win by five clear goals against Australia. Well, that's the thing. We've... We're confident, aren't we? We're going to do an under the cosh bet every week. Just for everybody else to get involved as well. Like we said, no commission, just us against everybody else. 
and some, someone's come up with a bright idea of England winning 5 0 against Australia. I wanted Maguire Hatrick as well oh, on the by back. By five goals. By five by goals. By five goals, sorry. Yes, by five goals. So basically, we're, we're probably just giving everybody a fiver, aren't we? Yeah. If England lose or draw or win by four goal, less than four goals, you fiver up. <laughs> <laughs> it's not coming out in our pocket, this is it, by the way. Hey, but, but, if, but if they win by five goals... Club Tropicana drinks are free. So all you got to do is follow the link in the description and uh, sign up, deposit a fiver, and then fair play will send you the free bet fiver to bet against us for, fi for England to win by five goals against Australia. And if they don't, you the win a fiver. In. Why have we picked that? I don't know. <laughs> I don't As we're saying it, it seems ridiculous, really, doesn't it? Be gamble aware as well, by yes. the way. Yeah, Get yourself involved. Fun. Links in the script. That's the thing. It's just fun. I'll tell you what. Was, well, Carlton's, <laughs> on it. Carlton's on his way now. So I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll do one now. What colour shoes has Carlton got on? Because he's he's a fancy Dan, isn't he, when he comes to his stage. Oh, wait, like, comes I'm going to go black. Black? It's Carlton's mm. not a black man. He is. <laughs> <laughs> Fiver. <laughs> <laughs> that was the easiest one I've ever fucking won. <laughs> it does not get any easier than that. <laughs> well, I'm going black. I'm going purple. White. Right. Put your fivers in, lads. Right, black, I'll white, fiver in. Any, any of the above. And up, I like this game. <laughs> you can get involved with our bet for, for the weekend. England versus Australia. Just follow the link in the description. And as Chris said, be gamble aware. You've got to be 18 or over. I'm very confident that you will beat us. You know, your journey into management, because um, from the things that we've heard from other players, your, your, your methods and your philosophy seems quite unique. Because you were obviously successful in business before you went into management. Mm -hmm. And did you bring more of that philosophy from the business world when you first started in management? Uh, the, the, way, the way, I think the way anybody manages must be formed by all of their experiences. So as a kid, I played for Venables at QPR. I played under George Graham at QPR. I played uh, under John Gorman at, um, at Gillingham. They were brilliant coaches. Venables was an unbelievable person at making you believe that, he gave you so much confidence, number one, that you were the best at doing what you did in the world. He just, when you played for Terry Venables, you just, you felt on another level. I don't know, I don't know how he did it. He just, he gave you this vision of how the team was going to play. You knew exactly what you had to do in any given situation, yet you went out there and just seemed to play your own game. Bizarre. George was just so demanding. You just, you just, you knew what he wanted in the next moment of the game and he had to do it. Like there was no, if that ball bounced there, you knew you didn't rock, want the rocket you'd get if you didn't put your head in. You knew you didn't want that rocket. You just knew what you needed to do because George was an absolute disciplinarian. So I've seen the sort of like the freedom and the organisation of Venables. I've seen the um, discipline of George Graham. John Gorman was just express yourself, express yourself, express yourself, like do something different. You go out on the training ground and spend like all session just trying to like do the Cruyff turn or like do that. I can't even remember what they call it when you kick it with one leg behind the other. What do they call that thing? When you Reborn, the Reborn, is it? The, the what? Reborn, is it? Yeah, that thing. When you, when you, <laughs> I didn't do Spanish at school, <laughs> but whatever it was, um, you'd be on the training ground just doing that until you got it right. And when you did it, you'd say like, "Do it in the game on Saturday." And that was that was George. Express yourself. Uh, sorry, um, John. Express yourself. So, in football terms, I had all those kind of influences in my in my world. Um, also, I, I was playing for England at, at youth level, and um, England were very much about you know they were the Graham Taylor philosophy was embedded into what England were doing. So I, I had all sorts of different influences in football. Then in business, my business grew up around Rupert Murdoch's News Corporation. And uh, by the time I was 28, when I first went into football, I was employing a thousand people. So I was managing all sorts of shapes, sizes of people, doing all sorts of different things in property and operational services. So we did everything from running printing presses to running buildings. And the newspaper industry really is, is a bit like football in many respects. It's all about results. Like today's product goes out today, it either sells today or it doesn't. 
and you get a result every day. We've sold 4.2 million newspapers. Tomorrow we've sold 4.1 million. If we didn't do our job and only 3 million got printed, then they only sold 3 million maximum. So you had to do your job every day. And it was a hard, disciplined, driven environment, really results orientated. So by the time I was 28, I'd had football influences, I'd had business influences, and that was where I was at in managing people. So you, you, go, you go into management or football management. I went in at 28 and I went in having broken my leg. Um, I was missing my football on a Saturday. I'd broken my leg playing uh, semi-pro football. Um, You're still recovering from injury when you started managing? Yeah, so right? I, I, I had my leg in plaster when I went down to Kingstonian where I played. I spoke okay. to Chris Kelly, who was chief executive, and said, you're bottom of the league, let me manage the club. And he looked at me with my, like, my plaster on my leg and went, what? I said, look, you know me. You know me. You know what I'm about. Um, I haven't got any licences, but I know, I know football and I know management. I manage a lot of people. I'll get the team winning. And he went, all right then, have a go. So I hopped in on my crutches and went into the dugout, drew 4-4 first game, drew 4-4 second game. But I drove them up into the top half of the table, joined them in December, got into the top half of the table by the end of the season. I think we finished eighth, having been rock bottom when I arrived. And um, that was my first job in football. So Were there I other players in that squad that were maybe more experienced than you in the playing world? All the lads that you had to gain the respect? Yeah, I mean, I think for a lot of my early managerial career, I was managing lads who were older than me and more experienced than me. That, um, were you not unfazed about that? I, I used to actively seek some of those players out. I like strong characters because you're going to build strong teams, you need strong people around you. Mm. On that, do you know if you sign a new player, and we, we've heard a lady tell a story about when you met Trundle. Say if you want to sign me and John and you, we've got a meeting. Are you just thinking, I want to get to know this lad? Away, probably away from football, I want to know what he's really like before so, he even walks in the room. Yeah, so, so, so Trundle's a funny one um, because if you hear the story in isolation, um, you'd think to yourself he's off his head. This guy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> probably if you hear the story in context, you still think he's off his head. <laughs> But, I don't want you to destroy this for me because it intrigues me. Your philosophy so, intrigues so, me. So one, one, of, um, one of the things that I'm, I'm big on, as time went by with experienced players, if I know that Park is one promotion into the Premier League, um, he's, now, he's now in his later career and he's thinking about joining me in League Two. And I'm, th I'm looking on thinking, do you know what? If he's the right type, then... I could be onto a winner here. If he's the wrong type, and when I say the wrong type, I mean, you, if you're at Stoke City winning promotion into the Premier League and you're used to playing in front of 30,000 and you're used to playing in 30,000 with the buzz of winning a promotion and then you're suddenly playing for me at Forest Green Rovers with respect, it ain't going to feel the same. And when you turn up on a Saturday afternoon, are you really going to go out on that pitch and like be able to motivate yourself and sustain the standards that we're going to need at Forest Green. Because I want people with appetite and hunger and I want people who are not going to be there not buying into what we are. I don't want Parky coming down and going, where's my pre-match meal? I go, we can't afford pre-match meals. Uh, that's what we do. Like, I'm a pro. Like, you know, I've played up. What do you mean? I, I want to drive for higher standards. Yeah, but Parky, we're so far away from being able to do pre-match meals that... It just, and I don't need that influence in the club. So it's not that that's a wrong influence or that he's wrong to demand it, but it's just not where we're at right now. Does that make sense? So I used to be, on the one hand, I loved players with that quality that could potentially drop down, but I wanted the right players to drop down. I wanted to see what the character was like. So Trundle was put to me in the, in the summer of my, I've been at Preston since the January and Trundle was put to me as an option that summer. And I can't remember how it came about. Maybe his agent rang me up and went, look, Lee's dropped out of the game. He's playing in the Welsh League or whatever it is. You know, he, he just wants to get back. Is it a pension job? Is he just like after one last contract? Is, is he serious about his foot? He said, look, meet him. So I went, all right, yeah, I'll meet, I'll meet him. So Lee comes down and it's in the summer and... John Massinho had joined me from Stevenage and he was going to be my captain, Massinho. And he'd actually come up for the day just to have a look around, try and find a house somewhere to live, 
But it was all nice and relaxed around the, around the, the ground. And I was sitting in my office. Moose sort of knocked on the door and came in. And uh, how are you? Good to see you. Where you been? Da, 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 da. Both in our flip-flops, you know. And uh, Lee Trundles arrived for you. I said, send him in. He said, oh, I'll, Moose said, I'll go. I said, no, don't. Sit, sit down, meet him. See what he's like. So in comes Lee Trundle. He sits down. So we're having a bit of a conversation. And, you know, where you been on holiday? Yeah, I've been here, been there. All right, you know, what are you all about? You know, we, we do things, you know, I like to do things differently. Are you like, are you a team player? Yeah, I'm a, I'm, I'm a team player. So we, we, you know, we do like to do things differently. We're always sort of searching for the 1%, looking for a, a, a bit of an advantage, you know. And I'm quite into yoga. And Moose, I see Moose's head look at me as if to say, Yo, what do you mean yoga? Like, when, when have we ever done yoga? <laughs> <laughs> and I, sort of, I see him look at me, and, and as he looked, I went, animal yoga. And Moose then, like, he's, I see something sort of choking in his throat. <laughs> and Trundle's looking at me as if to say, animal yoga? Like, what is that? And I said, I said give him an example, Moose. And Moose is like, <laughs> well, with, I said, well, look, Lee, I said, are you open to new things? He said, yeah, I'm open to new things. I said, well, I said give you an answer. I said, get down on all fours. So Trundle, he, <laughs> he, he, he gets, up me, gets up and he's, he's like, he's down on all fours on the floor. And <laughs> Moose is looking on, I'm looking on. And I said, right, I said, just, just, just relax, in, relax into it. I said, I said let's, let's go with like an elephant. And I said, so just relax into, so Trundle's relaxing all the floor. So shut your eyes. <laughs> At which point I could look at Moose and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> and, and Lee's on the floor. I said, right, I said, you, you're probably starting to feel your, your trunk moving, are you, Lee? He went, yeah, yeah. I, could. I said, well, get your arm working. So Trundle's <laughs> arm starts working. I said, yeah. I said, you know what they, you know what they do with elephants? I said, they, when they herd, I said, when they herd, they, they get excited and they start making that sort of like, mm, noise. <laughs> I said, have you got that in you? He went, yeah, yeah, I've got it, I've got it, I've got it. <laughs> Come on then, let's see you. I said, you're going to rampage. I said, get your leg down. <laughs> so Trundle's on the floor in my office. <laughs> At which point, we broke down. <laughs> we broke down. Trundle looks up and goes, you pet, you've done me, haven't you? You've done me. <laughs> yeah, we've done, we've done you. But do you know what? You've done me as well. Because what you've just done for me... What I, what I loved about that was Lee is saying to me, I'm not too big to be a part of something. I'm not too big. I'm not living on my past at Swansea, Premier League, da-da-da-da. Actually, I want to be part of something. I want to join in. And to me, I'm testing his character. I'm having a look at what I'm working with. And I think the best people that I've ever met, they're serious about their business, but they don't take themselves too seriously. And I think Lee Trundle said to me then, I'm serious about my business, but I don't take myself too seriously. So from a character point of view, I've gone, I like him. And he signed. So I didn't sign him just because he <laughs> played the part of Nelly. But it played its part in me having a look. It's better than the psychometric test. Yeah. He could have filled out a check sheet and gone tick, 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 X, 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 but he did the elephant instead. I heard about the, the medal winner crack 10 years ago. And again, this is all about context because I thought I can just, obviously not knowing you then, I can see you stood up and meaning it and trying to, I don't know, this arrogant <laughs> man. But then when Lady told his stories and just from meeting you, I'm guessing it was just a tongue in cheek thing that's just been completely taken yeah, of course it was. the wrong way. Yeah, the, the, the medal winner thing, I think it came from, it's probably... Second game in at my time at Preston, we were playing away at Yeovil. And um, for me, the dressing room is a place where what goes on in the dressing room stays in the dressing room. But um, in that particular situation, because it's been put out there, I think it's been written about in a book, um, which is how it got out there. It's like, you know, he came into Preston and he announced himself to the, to the team as a medal winner. So you imagine it. You've got this, you got this person who's competent enough to for Preston's board to go, yeah, we think this is the guy for us. And you can imagine them, you know, recruiting someone whose first job is going to walk in in front of a group of experienced players and he's going to go, let me tell you, like, I am the medal winner or <laughs> my kids call me the medal winner. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's improbable <laughs> and um, it's, probably, it's probably ludicrous. So we're at Yeovil and I'm in my team too, and I can't quite remember what 
what happened, but one of the players was with his programme and, and on his phone behind the programme in my team talk. Because he was doing that, I thought, in my head, I'm thinking to myself, all right, he's cruising for a bruising, but he ain't setting my agenda. How, how, do, I, how do I deal with this? And it's, this is like split second thinking. So um, what I probably did was in that split second, turn to that player and say something like, um, if you want to get involved in a confrontation with me, like you need to know, even my kids call me the medal winner. Like there's, there's one winner if this goes the wrong way. <laughs> That's probably what happened. At which point everyone in the dressing room goes, and I probably went, <laughs> and that was that. And then 12 months, 18 months, two years later, there's a book written and somebody goes, yeah, he even called himself the medal winner. Yeah, I did call myself. <laughs> that was the context, that was the situation. And I think everybody present knew that I was having a laugh, talking a joke. And the most surprised people of all, of course, were my kids who had never... Never called me. <laughs> <laughs> that said, I do now sleep on my medals. <laughs> I said yeah. this. I said this during ladies about when you f first went to Preston. Would you have done anything different? Would you have yeah. let the players get to know you first before you try to get your sense Would of you humour? Yeah. No, I. I think um, hopefully you, you know as people get to know people, they get a flavour for what they're dealing with. I'm not stupid. I've managed a lot of people, a lot of situations, and. Um, I've had, I've had a good degree of success. That's not bragging, that's just a fact. So I know, I know what I'm doing. Nobody knows all the answers. Everybody gets things wrong. Remember Barry Nicholson saying to me, close to my, the end of my time at um, Preston, he said, I, I, I've, I've not really got to know you brilliantly well. I've been injured and I've not been around the team that much. But he said, I think you made a really big mistake. He said, because there's so many senior players here, I feel as if, you should have sat more of us down and like worked out what we thought was wrong. And he said, I think if you'd have done that, you'd have got a lot more people on board with you. And, and I, I said to Barry at the time, I said, you know what, I, I get that, but the team had lost 12 in 13 when I arrived. And, you know, a, a lot of the, the players that were there had to be regarded as part of the problem. So... I'm looking at those players when I walked in the door, number one thinking like, you need to get off your high horses, some of you. I'm not, I don't need to listen to you. Like if, if you had enough about you, some of you would be sorting the results out. So I was thinking that. But number two, I knew that a lot of those lads had to go. Like my agenda was set. I had, a lot of those lads had to go. Economics dictated. That had to become that. You know, it was that was difficult that stage, and I no, I don't regret. I have regrets there. Where I got it wrong at Preston was in that summer. I went out and signed John Massino to be my captain. I went out and signed John Welsh, captain of Tranmere, good player, played in the championship. He was available. I could get him, brought him in. I've got Welsh and Massino for the same position, and I did it in too many areas of the, of the squad. I was thinking build up a squad. We've got two players in every position, but. I was going to put the captain's armband on Massino and I'm going to leave Welshy kind of sitting on the sideline. And I just got it wrong. I had Lairdy at left back. I had Dave Buchanan. They're both more than capable of playing promotion winning football in League One. Both of them. But I only had one shirt to give out. And Buchanan didn't want to be, you know, get playing bit parts on the sidelines. And I, that's where I got it wrong at Preston. I had too much of that. And then I had some strong characters. Like I said, I recruit strong characters. I had too many strong characters who weren't getting enough game time off me, and they went the, they, they, well, I say they went the wrong way, that's unfair on them. They weren't with me because I wasn't with them. And you know, I, loved, I loved them, I tried to love them, but I couldn't give them what they wanted, which was you know, a regular first team shirt. And I think that's where I lost my way at Preston. It's the biggest mistake I made. I was gonna ask, I was going back to your original point about losing 12 games in a row. Normally you speak- I think it was 12 and 13. Yeah, something like yeah. that. Normally you speak to players and they're like, what, what did he do? And it was, he just raised morale. He just put a smile on our faces in training and this and that. And I was going to ask what you did, your first job at Kingstonia, when you said they were bottom of the league and then at the end of the season they were up there. And I'm guessing you'll have done something like I've just said, just put smiles on people's faces. Would I be right or? Um, 
And, and probably brought in four or five better players. I mean, the, the easiest way to make a big difference in, in my experience is if you, can, if you can look at a team and go, I think it was Brian Clough who said, give me a goalkeeper, a centre-back and a centre-forward and I'll give you a football team by putting eight people around them who can run. And I don't think he's far off it. I mean, how can Brian Clough be far off it? Guy's a <laughs> genius, hey? If you come in and make one or two big signings, one or two good signings, I think that can make a big difference. I always tell a story that people, people look at me and think, he's a loony. Um, <laughs> about, um, it, there was an experiment done where they got a, a jar of fleas and the fleas were jumping up and down in the jar. And if you look at it under a microscope, you see like a black fuzz up above the top of the jam jar. And then they screwed a cap on it. And what you see with the, the jar is that the, the, the fleas, they jump up and down, but they don't want to bang their heads. They're fleas, but they're not thick. They don't want to bang their heads. So they start jumping just short of the lid of the, of the jam jar. If you then take the lid of the jam jar off, the fleas stay at the same level. They stay in the jar because they don't recognize that the, the lid's not there anymore. And so this experiment was used to demonstrate what happens with people. Is that If you put a, like a cap on people, they start performing lower than they're capable of. And the only way you get those fleas to jump higher again is to inject a couple of new fleas who don't know that the lid was ever there. They start jumping higher and the others start following suit. So I think the easiest way to change a group is to whack one or two in whose standards are higher and then everybody else just finds it easier to like raise their own game and go with them. And I think what you're saying there about, about morale and about lightning, you know, you can, of course you can get a manager who's feeling pressure, who's feeling results, who's feeling pressure, and he starts taking it out on the team, taking it out on the players. He's blaming players and everybody just goes down with him. His morale drags mm. everyone down because he's trying to blame everyone else around him instead of owning the results. I honestly think bringing one or two in is, is the thing I've done that's really changed, is the game changer when you take over a new, a new club. Have you always um, enjoyed a bit of physical, co physical contact with your players? Yeah. Because I know, I know you've got a good relationship with Morgs, but there's, I heard a story about, was it something in the gym, you and Craig Morgan? Did you try and take him down? Oh, I probably... And he's, just, he's an ox, isn't he? I probably might have done that, but... <laughs> 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 But again, if you would worked with me as a player long term, you sometimes as a manager, you, you, you can forget, I think, that not everyone will understand your rationale. So if, you, if you'd worked with me as a player long term, what you would have, have heard me say is 50% of goals at the stage where I was at in my, in my sort of managerial analysis, 50% of goals get scored at set plays. I was always big with my players on man marking and on breaking free from man markers. If, I'm sure if I said to you, who was the best man marker that's marked you, who would it be? Possibly Chris Morgan. So, uh, me, Tony Adams. I've, I've never ever been man marked like I was man marked by Tony Adams. And if you've been, like Park has gone Chris Morgan and I'd go Tony Adams, we all know what it's like to be well man-marked. So I would say to my lot, in a week, I might come in. I might go, morning, Brownie, how are you doing? And I'm man-marked. <laughs> and you look at me and go, what are you doing? I'm man marking. You're like, what are you doing? And you look at me and go, is that all you got? <laughs> so I might do it the other way around. And I might go, I am going in my office. Stop me. And, and they'd look at me and say, I said, stop me. And I'd go to go and go, stop me. <laughs> so what I'm trying to do in all aspects of my week is every time I see a player, I man-mark him or I make him man-mark me. If you add that up, you add up every 1%. Every time a player broke free from my man-marking, I used to think to myself, got a little bit more of a chance at the weekend of him breaking free from his man-marking. <laughs> and over the course of time, my team's records at scoring from set plays and defending set plays were very, very good. Very, very good. Maybe all that man marking made a bit of a difference. Maybe it didn't. Can you remember playing us at Doncaster? You spanked us three, I think. It was probably early on in your, the first season Preston. at Preston. Yeah, second season. Yeah. 
was it the second season yeah, yeah. In, in league it was when we got relegated we played them and Bailey Wright was marking me and he was doing exactly that and I know Bailey I was like Bailey what are you doing just relax <laughs> honestly he was just <laughs> get out of it get out of it go on get out of it it's like come on Bales <laughs> but that now it that all makes sense <laughs> So, so yeah, all, all this, uh, you know, you hear the stories about he goes in and fights his players every day. I never fought a player. I used to man mark the players. <laughs> and if they could escape me, then good luck to them on a Saturday. They might be a little bit better. If they're a little bit better, then I've achieved my objective. And I think, you know, the players who worked with me long term would know exactly what I was doing. I guess there could be a club where someone's either not been in a team meeting, not understood where I'm coming from, and gone, what's he doing? Um, <laughs> and yeah, it could be confusing. But that goes, that goes back to Go getting to know you. What I said yeah, before about realising what you like. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, you know the success that you had at Stevenage yeah. in that second spell, FA Trophy, consecutive promotions. But you were, did, it, did it take 18 months, two years before you started gaining that real success and kicking on? Do you think you needed that time to build a brotherhood? and get to know the characters, filter them out, get them to know you. Yeah, I think in the, in the first six months of that spell, I mean, my, my, my first seven results there, I think, I think I, I won one. They finished sixth under Peter Taylor the year before. So I didn't inherit a bad squad. I inherited a good squad. And that first seven games, I think I, I got a win, two draws and four defeats. So seven games in, I've inherited a team that finished sixth and I've got one win in seven games. So... Obviously, I'm getting something wrong. And I think when I looked in on that squad, I was like, he ain't having me, he ain't having me, he ain't having me. So and is that, he's got to go, he's got to go, he's No, not go. at all. That's, that's, what's the problem? Like, I, I, just get, I just get that feeling between you and me that things aren't right. What is it? You don't always have to tell each other everything. You can just solve things in a way that works for you both, you know? So, um... Yeah, I think I've I think I've had a, a lot of, of of good honesty. Listen, I've had I've had there's people out there who will give you stories about me, and and their their take on the story is nasty, because at the time they didn't like like their dealings with me, and I'm okay with that. I'm all right with that because sometimes you don't you know you don't break free from a man marker by um, being nice to him. You know, sometimes you've got to step on his toes, huh? So. If I've got to step on someone's toes to help the whole thing to go forward, then I'll step on their toes. But I like to show people respect, first of all, if they're working with me. I like to show them respect and give them a chance. And then it's like the um, you, players, I think, don't always appreciate that managers are managers for a reason. And there's that great story. I, I love it every time I hear it. The, the old man at the McDonald's drive-in. You heard the story? So he's at the McDonald's drive-in, the guy, and the bird behind gives a toot on the, on the hall and like, hurry up, mate. Like, he's trying to like, do his order. And come on, mate, hurry up, will you? What's, what, what's wrong with you? And he looks back and he's like, you know, does his order. And he goes to the pay window and he, he, he says, I pay, he said, I'd like to pay for her food as well. And uh, that's nice of you, you know. She takes the ticket and he goes through to the collection window and she comes up behind and she goes to the pay window and went, oh no, look, he's, he's paid for your food. She's like, oh my God, she went, beep, beep, beep. I'm so sorry, thank you so, oh, what a guy, you know, what oh, amazing. He goes to the food window and goes, there's my two tickets. He gets both sets of food and she's got to go around to the back of the queue. <laughs> <laughs> managers are managers for a reason. <laughs> they might look old sitting in their car, tapping the old McDonald's window, but... They've got weapons. So, <laughs> you know, as much as players do need to be respected, and they do, they need to respect managers as well because managers know their way around. It's like you said about them stories. It all comes with success as well of how it's taken. You know, Lurdy's telling us these stories with affection. And he's, like you said, he come from somebody else who's had a bad, a bad experience. And it's yeah. all like, cracking walnuts. What's he on about? He's off his head. Don't know what he's... But Lurdy's absolutely loving it. And if you go out and get results. Uh, yeah, and I mean, listen, if you're doing team talks, I've done 920 team talks or so, and you want people to listen to you, you can't keep turning up and just writing the team up on the board, can you? If you want people to listen to you. And if you're, you know, my agenda with any team is always from week to week, from game to game, can I make you better in some way or other? Um, and there's a lad Darren Murphy played for me, and he said to me, he texts me, 
after the Lady podcast with you. In fact, a few people texted me after the Lady podcast, <laughs> which is what led to me coming on. Because <laughs> I thought, there's, a lot, there's a, enough people who are listening to Lady's embellished stories. <laughs> so I'm just going to put one or two little bits and pieces straight here, which is my entitlement. Um, but Murph said to me, um, you know, you, you were a manager who made us better players, but more importantly, you made us better men. And I think that your job as a manager, I'm 55. Players who play for me today could be 18. My boy is 18. Um, I try and make him a better player every time I watch him. I try and make him a better player every day. I must drive him mental at two o'clock in the morning every night when I text him. Um, <laughs> Do you man mark him every time you walk past him as well? It's John, it's John, it's John, it's John, it's John. You want to see him try and get out to Carl and they're dropping him off? He's, he's got no toenails. I've stabbed him every time. Go on, get out, get out, man. But, um, but yeah, you're trying, to make, you're trying to make the player a better man and a better person all the time. And um, that's, that's all that I do. I'm th from team talk to team talk, what can I teach them today? Is that can I pick something out of life? I will, I'm I'm a person. I'll go and watch. I'll go and watch a film. If I get a spare hour or two, I'll go and watch a film in a cinema that I've never even thought of watching to get a story that might have some inspiration in it that I can take and share with the team on a Saturday. Like, I won't waste a minute of my life in terms of trying to enrich myself with stuff I can give to players to make them better people. If they're better people, they'll be better players. If they're better players, they'd be better people. I, I, and I just, your job as a manager is to just coach people to become the best version of themselves. And you've got to work really hard to give yourself enough, enough material to be interesting for players to keep wanting to listen yeah. to. So the, the walnut thing, I, I mean, I can't, I can't remember every single team talk and I can't remember every situation. I can remember bringing those walnuts in. I can remember <coughs> saying to Ronnie Henry, like, what are you going to do with it? Like, I'm watching him fumble around with his walnut. I can remember getting a sledgehammer out and smashing it to pieces. <laughs> and I can remember looking at that team and thinking, yeah, you get what I'm saying. Like, we've got to go all in today. We can't go half-hearted because they're a tough nut to crack. They're a tough nut to crack. I remember we haven't, we haven't got onto it and I thought you would get onto it before me. But um, Chris Wilder <laughs> was, Chris was a tough nut to crack. Yeah, you, that's what probably led me to Chris. My first um, <laughs> experience of managing Chris was uh, managing against Chris. He was manager at Halifax, I was manager at Stevenage. Again, I can't quite remember whether he'd been sent to the tunnel or whether I'd been sent to the tunnel. I think it was me, but I can't remember which way around it was. All I know is that post-match, we did them 1-0. It's a tough game. He was a clever manager and, and his teams worked hard. So I always, I always knew when I, when I managed one of his teams, there was, there was no easy points that you were going to get out of this game. But one of us was in the tunnel and I think it was me because I, I remember him walking towards me and I remember being at the top of the tunnel at Stevenage and I was kind of standing there as if to say, yeah, well done, mate, yeah. And as I shook his hand, his left hand came out and he grabbed my nipple and he ripped my nipple so hard, <laughs> I yelped like a cat. I went back, I went, ah! And I landed, as I landed, I sort of took a step forward as if to say, like, let's have it. And the referee walks into the tunnel. So I'm sort of like, uh, another day. And walk back into my dressing room. But my nipple for, <laughs> I reckon, three or four days. Three or four days? <laughs> He caught me like I'd never been caught in my life. I didn't even know what had happened to my body, <laughs> but my brain was in overload. And um, that was the beginning of like my rival with Chris Wilder. And did you like that in a, in a weird way? Did I you think, it. here we go? I loved it. I, I just, I loved that sense of, I love that sense of you've beaten me, but you haven't. Like I'm, 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 I'm going to come again. It's like, uh, yeah, you've got a result, but I'm still here. The war's not over. <laughs> I loved it. I thought, all right, yeah. And over the over the years, we beat them to the conference title. Yeah, I, I really took pleasure at beating them to the conference title. We beat them to promotion in League Two, and I really took pleasure. I used to really like the contest I had with Chris. That said, I've got a lot of respect for him, and I was probably amongst the first people when he took Sheffield United to the Premier League to text him and say, 
respect. Like, you've done at Sheffield, which I really wish I'd done at Preston, and I didn't. Yeah. I messed my chance up, and you've taken yours, and fair play to you. So but, you did, uh, you did yeah. ring him? Huh? You did ring him? Oh, I can't. Do you know, I listened to all that ladies talking about phone calls and under pressure and messages coming onto my phone with under pressure playing onto my phone. I, I can't remember all the details. All I know is... I think it definitely yeah. happened. All I know definitely is happened. all that happened around the game where we beat them 1-0 to seal the conference title. Yeah. And um, I think Lady scored a penalty that night to, to win the game. We won 1-0. Uh, I remember in that game, my, my sort of most thrilling moment from a managerial point of view, I'd said to the players before the game, we worked on it the day before, I said, we'll be one nil up and in the last minute, they'll get a free kick. And what we're going to do is we're going to hold our line and we're going to run out and leave them all in there. And as they delivered that free kick, my side ran out and left their whole team in there. And it was like one of those moments where you thought, yeah, I, I looked in their dugouts and said, you've just been beaten by the champions. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, you got my nipple, I just got you offside. <laughs> <laughs> you remind us a lot of Phil Brown because... If someone said to Phil Brown, if you turn up a, in a leotard to train and you'll get a win on Saturday, he'd, he'd do it. He'd do anything if, to, to get a result. You know, your team talks, like, you say your missus had, a, missus had a dream or something, just to anything to get a result. Yeah, I don't know if I'd turn up in a leotard. <laughs> <laughs> I've got one here, actually, if you want to try it on. <laughs> I think... I think... I think I might not turn up in a leotard, but... <laughs> <laughs> you've definitely, Brownie, you've definitely got me wrong. You've gone too far for Great Too Westland. much. But listen, if you've brought your leotard with you, <laughs> I mean, by all means, come out. <laughs> you know, your, your training regime... Yeah. And I keep f focusing on this this togetherness, the, the, the brotherhood, because it's the psychology... What, what were too much for you, John? Uh, the longevity of the days, uh, and it was it was hard, weren't it? You used to train the lads hard. Yeah. Uh, Is that to get that, the lads who aren't willing to commit to quit? I think that it takes twenty percent effort to achieve eighty percent of the result. I think it takes an extra eighty percent effort to achieve twenty percent of the result, and I think it's vogue. It was vogue in football to do the 20% and achieve the 80%. And I think, you know, if, you're, if you've got players who are good enough to play in the championship and they're all together in League One, they get your results anyway, even by doing 20% of the work. But I was never in a situation, really, at the clubs I was at, where I had the very best players. And I say that respectfully to all my lads. I had lads who had to put in the extra work to be physically, mentally, tactically strong. Because if I got them physically, mentally, tactically strong, it meant that any technical deficiencies could kind of be overcome. I remember Dave Prutton um, saying to me when he was working for Sky, he said to me, I remember coming to Stevenage when I was at Sheffield Wednesday, and he said, we, we came out of the tunnel and we knew, we knew you were going to beat us because we heard like music pounding out of your dressing room, like either Tiger or something was coming out. And there were these like massive pictures of like John Ashton, like looking like he's going to eat us. And it, it, your lads came out and every single one of them looked like a total beefcake. And every single one of us, as he came and shook our hand, like shook our hand so hard, our, our arm was coming off. He said, by the time we kicked off, we knew we were getting beat. And I said, what, did you like playing fear of them, you mean? And he went, kind of, yeah. We beat them 5-1 that night, they were 4-0 down at half time. It was like men against boys. And it was our first season up in League One. And, and we, we did that to Sheffield Wins. So good side they were with some good players, but the, the prowess that we built by the work we put in, yeah, listen, we did watch a lot of videos. We did make sure that every player knew who he was playing against. I made sure that every player had seen his fullback trip up, I had seen the last 10 goals that centre half had conceded, had seen how that, that centre half always dropped in at the near post and left that space just in behind him. And if we crossed the ball into that zone now and arrived late, we'd get that goal. So we spent tons of time 
preparing the team tactically, preparing the team physically so they could go and go and go and go. Ran over. So if you look at Steven Nish's results under me, so often we ran teams into the ground in the last 20 minutes. They just they couldn't stay with us. We scored goal after goal after goal late where you know, our work in the gym, on the training ground, to be as strong and as physically good as we could be. So we had to weaponise the things we could weaponise other than their football inability. Because some, some of the lads I've had have had limited football inability. Mm. How did you get on with the invisible dumbbells? The invisible weight session? <laughs> Tough. <laughs> one, of, one of the toughest weight sessions they ever did to me. But... <laughs> He never would have done that. <laughs> like I said, might be a little bit of fabrication <laughs> after this speech. Parky, you and I need to talk. <laughs> I think I need some royalties. Off of these. I'll have some royalties off your speeches. You can get using the stories. I might even back your stories. <laughs> but um, again, context, right? I think I remember that session. And I think what happened was that I was at Preston. And I used to do a session with the lads Thursday afternoon, 12 and a half kilogram dumbbells. I heard Lady talk about it last week. And we would do a thousand bodies. And it doesn't sound like a lot of weight, but when you're doing a thousand bodies on your biceps, on your triceps, on your shoulders, and again, and again, and again, and again. And most of what we did was game specific. So it would be, if your arm's gonna be strong to block Brownie when he tries and runs through it, we're gonna put the weight in your hand and you're gonna block. So it was all game specific movements that the players were doing with the weights. And people felt the force of it. They used to know in games that you couldn't run through a Stevenage arm. If you, if a Stevenage player went to shut you down and you went to give it and go, that that Stevenage player's arm was strong enough just to knock you off balance. So. We did a lot of work and it was all game specific and the boys were all bought into it. When I went to Preston, my 12 and a half kilogram dumbbells were missing. Where's the dumbbells? They're not here, someone's taken them. Oh right, okay. Better go home Gaffer, had we? <laughs> no, no, I'll tell you what we do. We do the session with invisible dumbbells. So one of the players hit them. I don't know where they were. <laughs> I don't know where they were. But like the guy in the McDonald's queue. I don't know where they are. So I'll tell you what we do. We'd do the session with invisible dumbbells. <laughs> invisible dumbbells? Yeah, we do. I'll tell you what, because they're invisible, we'd do 2,000 today. So instead of being there for 45 minutes, we're there for 90 minutes. And we did an invisible dumbbell session. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a good sweat on, because if you tense your arms, I didn't realise, but if you tense your arms while you're doing it, you actually get quite a good dab on. <laughs> so I did it for 90 minutes, and guess what? Next week, the bells were back. We did a 45 minute session, not a 90 minute session. So <laughs> who was the winner? <laughs> <laughs> But I, I think there's context around everything. Yeah. Right? Does yeah. he do invisible dumbbell sessions? Not normally, but if I've got if to. Somebody's, if somebody's in the dumbbells, you do. <laughs> if, I've to, if I've got to, I will, and we'll do 2,000 instead of 1,000. So, <laughs> Hundy messaged. Best. Did you used to get in boxing on a Monday, Paul Huntington? Again, boxing. Where does boxing fit in? If you think about, um, you think about what you learn when you box, you, you, you learn to put a guard up and you learn, learn to have a confident face and a confident head inside a guard. And what, what we used to find, again, if you, if you go back to set plays and you watch, if you watch a team of 11 players, how many players are confident to put their head in and win a ball? So if we're gonna be good at set plays and I can get seven of my players to be more confident with their head because they're good at using their arms, then maybe I'll win even more headers away and even more headers at their goal. And because set pieces score 50% of goals in football, I worked with a boxing coach and said, look, what I want is players who've got the confidence to be stronger in the air because they're less worried about putting their faces in because they're better at using their arms. The best teams I've had have always been ones where we're very good at set plays and there's a lot of courage, but the courage comes from the confidence from the technique of being able to use your arms to protect spaces to use your head well. So. Um, and is that the Friday morning session when we're all in the in the penalty box, a throw egg catch? Go now, Lady, Lady's got a terrible memory. I just <laughs> are, we, are we on murder ball? Here? Murder ball. Murder ball. He yeah. calls throw head catch murder ball. <laughs> throw head catch is not murder. <laughs> I went to um, Carrington to watch the great United side. When I say the great United side, the 1999 treble winners. Um, I'd met Sir Alex Ferguson. Um, I'd had a really good one-on-one -on -one session with him. And he said to me, any time that you want to like, come and have a look, see what we do, da-da-da-da-da, you're welcome. He did a session 
in a penalty box. Two goals, one at either end of the penalty box. And he had 22 players in the penalty area. And I have never seen a ferocity in a short-sided game like I saw that day. They were all there. Keane, Neville, Skulls, all the big hitters, the treble winners. And I've never seen a training session like it. Uh, honestly, I was wincing watching this session. And I remember afterwards him saying, games get won and lost in penalty areas. If players, if you want to get the ball in the net, you've got to go through a lot to get the ball in the net. You want to keep the ball out, you've got to keep a lot out. You've got him hurtling at you to try and put the ball in the net, brave, strong at it. You've got to do a lot to keep that out. So if you go to a Saturday and that's the only time they face players going all in, you've got no chance. They need to face players going all in during the week. And then when they come to a Saturday, they'll know what all in looks like. And I went, makes sense. I've never seen a session like it. I went back to my lads and said, this is what I've just washed. We are going to do that every week. Every Thursday, we're going to do that session. They called it murderable. It was ferocious. But we were good in penalty boxes. And they tell the story. They talk about the blood. And, oh, if you get cut, you get in the team. If you get cut, you get another contract. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I don't. I mean, if you get cut, you're stupid. If you get cut, you're not very good. If you get cut, you need to go and see the boxing coach because you're not very good with your arms. So I don't know where all the embellishment comes from, but <laughs> let them enjoy the embellishment. Is it true that when negotiating with Ben Mir, you jumped on his back and screamed, will you be my warrior? I I, that doesn't <laughs> sound like me. <laughs> <laughs> it does. It does. No, no, no. It does not sound like me. <laughs> Fuck off. <laughs> I don't, I don't remember it. If, it. if it was me, if it was me and I remembered it, I'd tell you. I don't remember jumping on Ben May's back and saying, will you be my warrior? It just doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't feel like the sort of thing I'd do. I mean... You've had Lee Trundle up on the fucking thing, you've been an elephant man. <laughs> I don't remember. I'd like, uh, there's a little bit of me that thinks I'm not stupid. Ben's, Ben's come from Millwall, right? He's a Millwall lad. He comes in to me for a, a chat about whether he's going to come and join me. So I just can't imagine me thinking. <laughs> I disagree. It's like, it's oh, like you're, like. you're going to sign John Parkin, right? You're going to sign John Parkin. You bring John Parkin in and you go, Parks, how you doing, bruv? Like, yeah, nice one, you know. How are you? Oh, I wonder if I shake his hand I'm like, oh, yeah. will you be my warrior? <laughs> <laughs> Is that going to make up? Think, yeah, let me walk in the door. Let me get behind this guy. I don't see it. <laughs> happened. It definitely happened. <laughs> How's the back, Ben? <laughs> Quick face. Brett Gents for a mention for our sponsor for this week's episode, Hello Fresh. I think this is my favourite, this. What, that one? The, the, this is my favourite one I've had from Hello Fresh. Which one? The lamb steak and garlic butter. So do you know if you had you know if you got that in a restaurant? You'd be dove at moon. You'd apple with that. It looks delighted. Good. Give give him a look, give him a look at home. I'll see your steak, John. But I'll raise you honey mustard sausages and a creamy sauce. Oof. I'm telling you it what you saying? Bloody lovely. I mean the good off. thing is you don't this this takes 35, 40 minutes, but you can get a 20 minute job. Yeah. You know, yeah, if you get in from work and you just can't, like we, we always do. If you're not aware at home, they send you the cards, they send you the ingredients, they send you the instructions. Full step proof. by step, idiot proof. Even for us. All your, um, all your herbs and spices, all the ingredients, get your card out step by step, what's next? Oh, and they're all in little sachets as well, so you're not even measuring out what you need. Cut the gibberish, Chris. Have we got an Have offer? Have we got an offer? 60% off your first box. 25% off all your boxes for the next two months if you choose to continue. And all you've got to do is scan the QR code on the screen or click the link in the description. That's Six plenty of discounts, isn't it? Oh. Four weeks in a month. 60% off your first one, 25% yeah, off the rest yeah. for two Just months. Trying to work it out. See, I want to normally put I want to normally put toasted flaked almonds on that, but... It's opening your eyes, isn't it, to, yeah. to cooking, John? And like you That's said, you can, you can go low calorie, you can go high protein, you can go quick meals. Meat free. Yeah, you can go meat free. Yeah. 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 I didn't, but you can. <laughs> I, would never, I never would, I'll be honest no. with you. I never would. I like so the yeah, mate. just click the uh, QR code on the screen and off you It's a good offer. Go. 
Great offer. Get yourself involved. So when when did when did you bring in the drinks breaks? Because I can remember you always telling us drinks breaks. Yeah. There's, there's, good hand good hand injured on the thirty third minute maybe. There's so many myths in football and. Um, managers start imagining so much when they manage against you and i don't think it, I, I don't think it pays to dispel anything i just i listen to everything and let it and just let it roll um i've heard everything i've heard drinks breaks i've heard voodoo dolls i've heard all sorts that, <laughs> that go on so i don't i don't rule anything out i just just roll with it with that what what can you remember as being your most how can i Say it. Just random team talk, random bit of thing you've done to get a result. And got the best response from. Yeah. I could remember it a million percent. Um, the best team talk that I ever did was us at Stevenage against Newcastle in the FA Cup. And I got them together. Uh, it was a 5.30 kickoff. I got them together about three o'clock and got a board up and went, right, Stevenage five, Newcastle nil. How does it happen? And they all went. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, how does it happen? And they went. <laughs> How does it happen? And they went, well, I suppose, I don't know. Um, maybe, I don't know, we get an early corner or something. And, and uh, you know, maybe like head one in or something or... Uh, um, and we started a conversation. And by the time we finished the conversation, we had a plan of how we were going to beat Newcastle 5 0. And it was to the minute, we went through like the 90 minutes, everything that was going to happen. There was a sending off in there. X was going to lose the plot. He was going to get rattled. He was going to get injured. He was, everything was happening in this plan. And by the time I got to the end of it, I thought, do you know what? We're going to win. We're going to win. I, I, I knew we were going to win. And we beat them 3-1. And honestly, there was only one team in that game. And that conversation of how we were going to win 5-0 led to us winning 3-1. And we were really deserving winners. We didn't like edge it, nick it. We won that game good and proper. Um, that conversation, I think. And it wasn't a team talk. It was a conversation. I think it was the best team talk. Like, stands out a million miles for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Who's the best chairman you've worked under? Such a difficult question because the circumstances of any club are really difficult. But the the three that I've probably spent longest with, um, Phil Wallace, obviously, I had four spells with uh, at Stevenage. We had our good times, we had our bad times, but at our best, we were really good. Um, Dara at Peterborough was something else. Um, I loved working with Dara, loved it. He's he's really, really difficult to work with, and I loved it. Um, He's so out there. He's so he so wants to win. He so talks things up. He so talks others down. Was he just constantly ch challenging you, having an opinion? And he, uh, he has lots of opinions, lots and lots and lots of opinions. But he's got a really, really good football brain. Like, like it gives you new ideas that you think. Good point. That's a good. That's a good thought. I hadn't, I hadn't thought of that. I hadn't seen that. So he was. He, he would. He would think about the way you were managing, give you ideas in the way you're managing. Um, he didn't force you to do it his way. Um, he chastised you heavily if you didn't do it his way and you didn't get the results. Um, but no, he was. I love. I loved working for Dara. He, the, the, the problem with me and Dara was we were we were both outspoken, and I think I probably once or twice overstepped the mark. I probably messed the relationship up. You know, I don't, I don't think I got fired for results at Peterborough. I think, you know, I, I've won four of my last eight games. I'd won 44% of my games at the club. We'd gone from bottom six to top six. So we were working really well together. Um, Overstepped the mark as in you were challenging him maybe yeah, a little bit too much. Yeah, probably challenging him. Yeah, you know, he, he, he thought X, Y or Z and I thought A, B or C. And I, and I just stood my ground. I didn't agree with what he wanted me to do in relation to this player or that player. And, you know, I felt as though I had a better insight into certain things. And um, I think if you ask him now about those things, he would say, in all honesty, you were probably right, me. I think he would probably now say, you were probably right. But um, he, was, he was great. Going back to the Peterborough one, this sounds so 
ridiculous but brilliant at the same time. In the contract about the shots, shots at goal at Peterborough, is that true? He wants 20 odd shots on goal in a game. Dara? Yeah. Um, I don't know if it was in the contract, but it's definitely in like the DNA of what he wants from his manager. So, you know, yeah, give me passes, give me shots. If you get shots, you'll get goals. Um, and definitely he wants passes and he wants shots. And, you know, as a manager, you know, that if you don't produce 600 passes in a game, if you don't produce 200 forward passes, if you don't produce 30 shots, um, you're not going to produce enough goals for him and not enough entertainment for his teams to be successful. So, yeah, 100%. He, I'm, I can't remember it being in my contract, but it's definitely in the DNA of what he wants from a manager, yeah. Would he, would he prefer to win? Because um, historically... Peter Begins have always had plenty of goals. Would he prefer to win 5-3 than 1-0? A million percent. He, he just attacked every opponent. It didn't matter who you're playing. You'd be playing Liverpool. He'd be talking about... He, he would be... You know, that Sabutio story that someone was talking about earlier on. I, I nicked the Sabutio thing that Lady was talking about from Bill Shankly. Bill Shankly's team talk, someone told me. Um, I think it was Kevin Keegan in the Kevin Keegan book, or I heard him at a dinner. So Shankly used to come in and his team talk was always the same. He had a Sabutio board and he, he put the Liverpool team out. He would go, you know, Lawler right back and whoever, Emily Hughes and Larry Lloyd. And he'd put the Liverpool team out and he went, Manchester United have got Bobby Charlton. And then he swept him off the pitch and he went, but he's one player. And he said, the rest of them are just shit. <laughs> and that was the team talk every week. And... I, I I go back to that sort of mentality and Dara had that attitude to every opponent. They're just nothing. They're nothing. And that was the biggest thing he used to do was you knew in the week he was building up to telling you that Liverpool are nothing. Man United, they're nothing. They're just nothing. He knew everything negative about every opponent and they're nothing. I mean, you did as a manager. You went into games thinking, yeah, like these are nothing. They're just nothing. Can I ask you about um, Farnborough? Because, you know, you talked about the importance of context and the, the narrative online when we put the questions out seems to be that you, you had a stake in the club, you were managing, they got the, the FA Cup game against Arsenal and then you, you went. That seems to be the narrative online. Yeah, uh, Farnborough um, was investigated by... Um, every sort of non-league journalist that could um, investigate. Everybody had a version of events around yeah. Farnborough. Um, I remember ringing up Adrian Durham, who did this sort of like anti-Graham Wesley campaign on TalkSport and saying, do you, do you even know what you're talking about? And Adrian was like, well, let's meet. So I went and met Adrian Durham. And I said, what, what, are, you, what are you talking about? Oh, you're you're anti-football. Why am I anti-football? What, what, what are you talking about? He went, wow, you, you moved the, the Arsenal game from like Farnborough to, to Highbury. I said, why did I move it? He said, well, money. I said, money? I said, what? Well, do you think there's more money in playing Arsenal at Highbury than there is in playing them at home in a live televised game? Do you, do you not think that a live televised game brings more money in than playing at Highbury? And he went, does it? I said, well, go and look at the numbers. Go and have a look at what a live televised game would produce. So he went and had a look at the numbers and he went, I didn't realise that you'd make more money playing at home than playing it away. I said, Farnborough's ground collapsed under a 3,000 crowd when they played Torquay and the safety authorities won't let the game be played at Farnborough. That's why the game's been moved. But the, the narrative was, oh, it's all being done for money. It wasn't done for money at all. It was done because... Arsenal demanded an insurance that we couldn't get because the ground had collapsed, because they were bringing hundreds of millions of pounds with the talent. We couldn't do that. The fire authorities, the safety authorities, didn't like what had happened. So the game got moved. And the non-league paper was busy. David Emery, God rest his soul, um, was the editor at the time. And I did the same with him. I rang him and said, David, you're all over this sort of like Farnborough story. It's all about money. And so when I went into Farnborough, Farnborough was bankrupt. They'd gone into a CVA. They owed £200,000. When I left Farnborough, they had a lot of money in the bank. I'm not going to name you what the, what the number was because I can't remember it. 
It's 20 odd years ago, but there was a lot of money left in the bank. And um, the shares that I bought, when I bought the club, I gave to a solicitor to give to somebody who wanted to take the club forward. So from my point of view, I bought shares, I gave shares away. I took over a club that owed, I think 200K on a CVA that was fully paid off and I left the club with money in the bank. That's the story of Farmer. So anyone who wants to talk anything different, um, anyone who's everyone looked into the accounts at the time, every investigative journalist from non-league football went into it all. The facts are very simple. So Farmer is a non-story. Did he, did the Adrian Durham do any, uh, uh, did he do another piece to say, oh, I might have got yeah, it to, wrong? To be, to, be, to be fair, David, uh, who gave me a really hard time in the non-league paper, um, and Adrian, both are really, David to the day he died, really good friend, and Adrian, really good friend. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we, we'll put up a good report. I mean, we, you know, I always think if you've got a problem with somebody, confront the issue, have it out, move on together, you know, and, and we, we did that. So, yeah, I've got no issue. Obviously, Lodi talked about them trips away that you used to organise for the players. And was that a, what was the thinking behind it? Was it unpaid for, by the way? Unpay for, yeah. Oh, you, ladies' stories you're talking yeah. about. <laughs> I, I, I don't remember. I don't remember exactly how they went on. I mean, he's talking about he met us at the airport. And all yeah. That. I, I can't imagine that I would have met him at the airport. I just, it, it doesn't sound like me. I've got better things to do in my time than like drive around the... I, I might have organised it all and yeah. found him a great place to go and made sure that, you know, everything was everything was in good order for him. But um, I can't imagine me being there with giving out the plane tickets. But... Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, <rat. laughs> So it's Steve is this way. Yeah, Steve is side. Yeah, next, next it'll be, he was waiting for us at the other end with one of those signs going, you know, <laughs> Steve is this way. And he was driving the bus with a cap on. No, I wasn't, I promise. But um, listen, sometimes we used to go to Thorpe Park. I remember going to Thorpe Park. And we would meet up at Thorpe Park and I'd give him a list, say, look, what I want from today is like 10, I want 10 video clips of you doing this and that and the other. Uh, we've got some of the funniest footage of all time at Thorpe Park where, like, one, one of the things was the, the, the cuddle. I remember John Ashton going and stealing a cuddly toy off of the basketball centre and the bloke running the basketball thing chasing John Ashton <laughs> as he's running away with a cuddly, <laughs> cuddly so this is, toy. This is on your list. I want to see somebody steal a cuddly toy. I didn't say steal a cuddly toy. <laughs> well, the best cuddly toy footage. So Ashton steals the cuddly toy. But so, some of the some of the stuff we got out of those days at Thorpe Park, where they were putting their video clips together, hilarious stuff that just lives with you forever. And um, whether it was that, we used to have a thing that Stephen is two minutes to win it, and we did it. We actually did it with the fans. So it went out once a week on a Thursday. It went out on um, on the website. So they used to get 10 minutes, two, sorry, two minutes to bring the room to hysterical laughter or rapturous applause. That was the, the thing. And Ash this day has got the responsibility. It was always someone different each week. And Ash goes, right, I want three people. He said, very, very simple. He said, I've got 200 pound, 200 pound and 200 pound. And I've got two eggs and I'm going to break two eggs on your head. If you let me break two eggs on your head, you get 200 quid. And they all thought, all right, let's have it. So Ash gets up, goes across and he goes, egg coming down his face, he's having a laugh, walks across, egg coming down his face, egg coming down his face. And Ash sat down and they went, and he went, nah, he said, I said two, I've done one. He said, 600 pounds is mine. He said, and you've got egg in your head. <laughs> 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 you saw these three blokes with this one egg dribbling down their face, thinking like, "What?" And that was that was that group. That group. <laughs> that group. Whether they were going for a few days in Portugal, whether they were going to Thought Park, whether they were in the team room doing something for the fans on the video clips, they were like brothers. They they had a good laugh together. Nothing to do with football. When they played football, you could see you could see the human relationships. And to me, whatever you're doing, if you've got those human relationships, you've got a chance. I don't know about you, Johnny, but it was rare that I ever even had a manager's phone number, never mind having a text conversation. Yeah. Where did that start? And 
what Clive was your... Woodward. So I, re I read the book um, Winning by Clive Woodward, uh, which he wrote obviously after winning the World Cup. And Clive Woodward in there said, uh, you know, I wanted to get every advantage with my squad. And uh, I heard him talk about the book Winning at a conference. And he said a few more things at the conference in addition to what was in the book. And he talked about one of the wisest things he did being getting it. In those days, we didn't all have mobile phones. Everybody had a laptop. He, he said people didn't even have a laptop, but he got the players all a laptop. And he used to sort of message the players on the laptop using email. So he used to have this sort of constant chat with his players on the email. And I, I read it and then I listened to him and he said, you know, and I, I'll be very specific. He said, like, I read, I, I learned from this psychologist that if you give players like food for thought about nine o'clock at night, they'll sleep on it. And he said, it'll embed it in their brain, have a much bigger impact on them when they wake up the following day. And I'm like, sounds like nonsense, but, but hey, listen, he's just won the World Cup. <laughs> no, no, he's just, won the, he's just won the World Cup. So like, how could I go about doing that? And we, so it was just around about the time where this whole sort of mobile phone thing was coming around and most people had just started getting a mobile phone and there was no WhatsApp or WhatsApp groups or all that sort of thing. So I just started texting players. It wasn't like all I did was text players. Outside of seeing you at the training ground, you know, it might, it might be that it'd be four o'clock in the afternoon I'd just go, you know, Brownie, like, you know, did you, did you do that that we said? And I started noticing that people... Off the back of getting that four o'clock thing, I'd speak to the analyst and the analyst would say, oh yeah, Brownie did come and see me. Where maybe you didn't go and see him, you would go and see him because you knew I was going to text you at four o'clock. So it, that's where it all started. That's where this sort of texting thing started. And yeah, I probably did on a Friday night send a message at nine o'clock to people just to say, don't forget, team tomorrow is this, big things are boom, boom, boom. And I was following the Clive Woodward philosophy and thinking, is there anything in it? Like you say with the leotard earlier on, if you do something and you get a result, you do it again. And if you get a result, you do it again. And I found that a lot of the dialogue, as, as much as players will say, oh yeah, you know, I, I didn't buy into it. You should read what I got back from players. You should read the input I got from players. And if you did read the input I got from players about, oh, I spoke to my mate at, at Donny and he's, he told me that such and such isn't playing tomorrow and X, Y, Z might be playing. And I'd go, oh, right, okay. I got a lot back from the lads when I sent them that little Friday night thing. Um, they'd give me a lot back and some of the clues they gave me were really insightful. And I know one or two of them wouldn't have come up to me at the training ground and gone, like gaffo, like just before I go, you know, X, Y, and Z. And, and then of course, once that's happened, when you see them, You've got something to talk You've about. You've brought that barrier down. You've broken the barrier down. It becomes easier then to, to have that conversation from their point of view. You're more mature, you're older, you're more able to have the conversation. They maybe aren't. And it helps them just to get into the flow of conversation. So over the course of time, I think texts, I mean, nowadays, of course, everybody does everything by WhatsApp. And, and Murphy said to me, he said, you, Murphy listened to the lady thing. He sent me a message, really nice message. And he said, you were ahead of your time. And... I don't want to put myself out there as being ahead of my time. I'm not trying to say that. I always try and get advantages. I always try and find different ways of doing things. You do the same as everyone else, you get the same results as everyone else. But I think footballers have changed. Um, because of the academy system, you know, w when we all would have played, we, you know, a lot, of, a lot of players came up not through the academy system. They didn't have as much emphasis on tactics, on video, on analysis, on technical development. There wasn't such a sort of like learning platform. Nowadays, there's a lot of stuff that players are used to having to do that back in our day, you'd look at it and think, what? What's it? Why you don't do that? It's not what footballers do. Nowadays, footballers do do that. It's a different era. So yeah, I probably did try and get into that era a bit earlier. Mm. And um, I think I've got some benefits. My, listen, as, a, as a manager, no one, no one gets it right. Everyone loses games. I've won 45% of over 900 games. That, that's not 60%, but there's a lot of managers who've, who've not won 45% of games. I'm 68% unbeaten. So, you know, that's not a bad, that's not a bad record. It, compa it compares favourably with a lot of How would you look back on that Sheffield Wednesday saga? Um, so you, you were at Preston not, it, and... Yeah, it didn't, really, it, it didn't really have a big impact on me. I mean, uh, 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 it's obviously disappointing when, when someone from the opposite dugout comes into your dugout almost laughing at you. 
we we done them five one Sheffield Wednesday when I was at Stevenage that same season. So it's the same season. We've done them five one. Later on that season, Graham Wesley brings his Preston team to Sheffield. Sheffield do us two nil. We got well beaten live on Sky. So I guess their guys are walking into our dugout going, you know, that's one back at you. Fair enough. Um, and then they say, we knew your team. Your players told us your team yesterday. And um, I let it be known that that had been said to me. Didn't make it true. But later on, I was told, oh, yeah, there was a cup of coffee the day before. And, yeah, the, the, you know, the team was put across to certain Sheffield people. I mean, is what it is, isn't it? I mean, you know, from the, from the Preston fans' point of view, which is probably the people I was talking to, was this is what I'm dealing with. Is, is it right? Is it right that our team gets told Sheffield Wednesday the day before the game over a cup of coffee? Um, it was put across to me as though it was done maliciously. And, um, yeah, I didn't like it. I didn't like it. I remember, I think Andy Rhodes was keeper coach and apparently they were just winding you up. Right. Just, thought, Sheffield you know, a bit of Sheffield Wednesday keeper coach. Yeah. So, you know, Wilder, mind games and this and that, it feels like they were just... Yeah, yeah. Winding your up. Yeah, well, people, listen, people can say what they want. Obviously, when you, when you go on something, you, you do it because you've asked questions yourself. So I obviously got to a point where, you know, I believed from my side that it was the case. Listen, if they, if they were winding me up and if I was mugged off and if I was made to look stupid and if, I, if that's the case, um, have you ever been nutmegged? Yeah, plenty. <laughs> Happens, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it is one of them, though. They've got to watch the nipples. That's what they can say. Is your proudest moment, looking back, at the managerial career? Proudest moment? I don't, I don't mean to be an ass when I say <laughs> I don't really do pride. I, I, when I was a kid, I was always taught pride comes before a fall. So... Uh, the, the, so I don't really do this pride thing. And I hear the word loads, and every time I hear it, I, I, it turns me off a bit because I, lo I love succeeding. Um, obviously, any time you lift the trophy, I, I, I can remember being at Old Trafford, wandering around with the promotion-winning trophy. For Stevenage to get into League Two at the first time of... Sorry, to get from two to one at the first time of asking... Um, I really enjoyed that. That was great. Lifting the trophy at Wembley for the first time is, you know, what, you, as, what I dreamed of as a kid. I didn't dream of lifting the FA trophy. I dreamed of lifting the FA Cup. But nonetheless, it was still lifting a trophy at Wembley and I, I loved doing that. Um, I loved seeing Connor go on to QPR and shake my hand and say thanks for everything. There's, there's so many moments where... To be proud of. No, I don't, it's, not about, it's not about that because I, I think... I'd sooner turn what you talk about as being pride into the next steps. Mm. That's where I'd sooner go with my thinking. I don't like getting any, that thing about pride comes before a fall. I suppose just a label on an emotion, isn't it? You're yeah, still yeah. looking back on. Yeah, I'm not trying, honestly, I'm not trying to be like a clever dick. Yeah. I, I, I genuinely, I always turn that feeling into what's next. Uh, I just mentally, I'm always like, right, what's next? Answer. Can you ever switch off? Do you, do you ever switch off just from everything? Not really, no. I, but then maybe I maybe I do that in the gym. I lo I love the gym. I'm I'm always in the gym, always running, biking, doing some weights, doing some abs. Maybe maybe the gym's where I do it. M maybe that's where I do it. Maybe I, maybe I do it in the gym. Has the treadmill know. ever beat you? No. <laughs> Never. <laughs> <laughs> Never. I I, I used to. Um, always let the treadmill like do weird things to me on a Saturday leading into a game. So <laughs> I'd always do, I'd always do 45 minutes on a Saturday morning and you can put it on that random mode where it, it does whatever it wants and you give it like top level random mode and it'll, go, it'll do this for a minute and it'll do that for a minute and you'll be doing it at 22 and all sorts of strange things are going on with that machine. I used to have to go into the dressing room and say to people, they say, whoa, what did, the, what did it do to you today? Or it did this, it did that. It's beaten. And I used, to take, <laughs> I used to take great pride when it broke down. See, well, the one time I took the pride was like, it's broken down. It, the machine's broken down. I've got to call Life Fitness. And <laughs> 
<laughs> when there's a life fitness van on my on my driveway, it's like, yeah. You best get yourself down here. It's done. Yeah. It's done Just imagine here. it goes steaming out here, <laughs> steaming and shaking. <laughs> but um, but yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I do. I like the gym. So maybe the gym park is my version of that. I'm interested to in know what you think because I know you, you like the data and stuff. And at Preston, did you do a thing where you got everybody? in the change room to pick their team and you had a tally chart of yeah. who picked who and you use that as say if, if I come and see you I've been left out for five games you'd go your teammates don't even want to <laughs> no but I, I'm, yeah. it's a genuine question yeah because I'm I, I think it's right yeah no there's a couple of bits of data that were always really important to me one, one of them was I used to um I saw something in the newspaper once which looked at Man United with Roy Keane and Man United without Roy Keane. So I started doing it for my teams. I'd look at every player and like, what was the team like with you? And what was the team like with you? And what was the team like with you? And I started noticing that when he played, we tended to win. When he played, we tended to win. When he played, we tended to lose. And it was like, I, those players, I used to draw it to their attention and say, look, when you play, we tend to lose. Have a look at your points per game record. Have a look at his points per game. Have a look at his, what, why do you think that is? What does he do that you don't do? So I'd use it as a sort of like, not as a humiliation tool, more like a, a learning tool. Where are you falling short? What's he got that you haven't got? Mm. And that created a lot of conversations that I think may put players under a lot of pressure to perform. And if you used it in the right way, it was a positive pressure. The thing about um, when I first started to use what you're talking about, um, yeah, I went to the team. I can't remember whether I did it on text or whether I did it as a form that they worked out. I just went, give us, your, give us your team. What team? I think the way I did it was more, Brownie, what team should I pick that would get the best out of you? What's the team that you'd put around you? And I, I more did it in the first instance to find out, did you like playing with inverted wingers or did you like playing with natural wingers? Did you like playing with three in midfield or two in midfield? Did you like playing with a second centre forward or as a lone striker? What, how, how could I get the best out of you? I didn't really do it in the first instance to, for other reasons. It was more about learning about you. Then I had the data. And then I noticed that everyone picked Parkey, but no one picked Brownie. Like, why is no one picking Brownie? So I used to go and have a few, why haven't you picked Brownie? You say, well, you, you notice, he, he never tracks his runner out of midfield. And then I'd go, I'd go and talk to the centre half. So you notice him, yeah, he never tracks his runner. You notice we're always getting overloaded. It's always his runner that comes. So I learned a lot from those. I had a lot of conversations that helped me. Then I could go to him and go, listen, Brownie, I'm leaving you out the weekend. I'll tell you why. I don't feel like you've been doing enough. But in the team thing we did, two players out of 26 put you in the team. Mm. Does that surprise you? And you'd say to me, it does a bit, yeah. So <laughs> you'd, be, you'd be gutted, wouldn't you? But, but, then, but then you're identifying that as not just receiving the infam that negative information from the manager. You everybody else is, it's not is me giving that feedback as well. So you're then thinking, I need, yeah, I need exactly. to change some of it here. But I suppose if you want to put it across in a negative way, you go, guess what he did? Like, you know, he's, he's sort of like, he's turning me on him and he's turning... But I'm trying to build a better team. I'm trying to help you to become a better player, trying to give you his, ver his appreciation of you and his appreciation of you. If you know what everyone's saying about you and what they're thinking about you, it gives you a chance to become a better version of yourself. So... It depends how you're using this. If you're creating information, you're using it in the wrong way or creating information and using it in the right way. And I think a lot of the data that I gathered, in the first instance, I probably did it maybe because I'm trying to work out how do I get the best out of Brownie? I know, I know, he, I know he gets goals. I can't get goals out of him. So where, where am I going? <laughs> where am I going wrong? Uh, wait a minute, I'll text you. <laughs> He's fucking shy. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you that for nothing. <laughs> you're, not get, you're not getting any out of him. No, as a rule, I mean, it might be different now, but footballers always look for excuses. They love a mourn and they find it hard to look at themselves. And I, I think something like that, it made me go, fuck me. If I haven't got, if I haven't got the respect of my teammates, I need to look at myself hmm. more than anything. Hmm. Yeah, and I think if you can promote those, if you get an environment where the players are happy to have those conversations, then um, you've got a good chance of going forward. And, and I think that's what that information always enabled me to do, was have good conversations. Anyone who wants to put it down, put it down. But 
It wouldn't scare me to face that. Mm. I'd like to know what my teammates were thinking. <coughs> me I think personally. it's the continuity of you, you having the a, new, very much of a nucleus of the same squad for so many years. I think it's that's uh, what what else is that. You know, if you my my I'm at the club two weeks and I'm saying you're fucking not doing that, then you're going to be like straight away, fuck you. Mm. Whereas if you know them well and you've been with them for plenty of seasons and you trust each other, I think it's a lot easier conversation. Yeah. Yeah, and I know what you mean, but I still think they'll, you'll find out exactly what they think of you as a player. They might love, you might love me as a lad, but you wouldn't have us in your team. Well, I'm going to be honest with you, mate. Me and Chris, you think you've been slacking this last <laughs> couple of weeks. <laughs> <laughs> we had loads of people asking about that going back to that Chef Wed game, the centre half up front. Yeah. And and I, and I kind of get it because I know that I played Stevenage before, and is it Charles? Darius Steve, Charles, yeah. yeah. He was a centre half, but he did a job up front. Yeah. But it just seems to get brought up. There's other, well, I know you'll know this, but everything seems to get brought up. The Sheffield Wednesday, the medal winner, and playing, who was the centre? Brown? Aaron, Aaron Brown? Brown yeah. Playing centre half up front with Hume on the bench, or I might be wrong, Hume might not have been, but other strikers on the on the bench. Yeah. What was your reasoning? Well, you, you're right. The, um, if, I, if I had a problem, um, then I would always try and think outside the box to solve the problem. I wouldn't, I wouldn't think to myself, well, I've got to go about it, like, you know, in the, in the stereotypical way. And I can't remember all the circumstances, but I think Neil Mellor had been injured the whole time I was there. Um, so I was down Neil Mellor up, up top. I can't remember who else I had, whether Humey was fit, not fit, had been injured, was coming back from injury. I can't remember. Um, Jamie Proctor, I think, had been out injured. I was probably v devoid of options up top. And um, we were playing Sheffield Wednesday, who were a big set-piece orientated side. You needed to pick a side that could, number one, go forward and attack them, but number two could defend them. I was probably light on the height in the side and probably spoke to Aaron in the, in the week leading up to the game and said, could you be Darius Charles up here? Could you do a job for me up there? Give us something to go into, hold a ball up. We would have had a conversation and... Maybe it didn't work on the day. Happens, doesn't it? Like you try things, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't work. When they work, great. If they don't work, don't kill yourself. If you don't try anything, you don't make any mistakes, then you never go forward, do you? So it would have been, there would have been a logic. I can't remember all the logic around it, but it would have been something like that, yeah. Are you trying to get back in as manager? Yeah, yeah, I would, I would like to get, I think Joe's situation is one where I really enjoy, I really enjoy watching him play. I enjoy trying to help him. I enjoy being able to go to his games. But I also, I miss being in a dugout and pitting my wits against somebody else, another club, trying to bring a group of players forward. Um, so, yeah, I, I, would, I would like to get back in. But um, it's, not, it's not that easy. You know, when you, when you go for, a, if you put your name forward for any job, you talk to any chairman, they've got 100 people, 100 good names, by the way, not, not people looking for their first job. They've got 100 good names coming at them. Um, so, you know, even getting a conversation with a chairman, I've, I've had a few conversations in recent months, um, even getting a conversation, you've got to work hard to do that. You have the conversation, you're one of 10. Uh, if somebody else is better on the day when he has his conversation, then, you know, he can go forward. So you've got to be patient when you're trying to get back in. Um, you've got to work hard. You've got to keep your eye on the game. You've got to make sure that you're ready to go when you do get your chance. No players know who you can go and get, know teams, have ideas, think about clubs. There's lots of work to do in the meantime. So, yeah, I'm doing my work. I'm getting around. I'm seeing games, watching players, um, getting my notebook ready. And um, if you love football, you love football, don't you? I mean, you, you do something with your football, you do this. Um, it must be great fun. It must be really good fun planning, preparing, getting into all the conversations. Parker going off and telling all these fibs. <laughs> 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 um, but... Um, but yeah, my 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 fun is you know being in the dugout and and trying to win three points and you know enjoy it and then get ready for the next three points. I I do love it. Yeah, we spoke about the crack with Wilder before um, about just getting an edge and stuff. Is there any other examples with managers where you've tried to wind them up or tried to get an edge before or after the game? I think listen. I think in any in any game, um, th there's managers who try and play you. You said Sheffield Wednesday played me. I'll have to look at who was in their dugout that day and get them all in my little black book now. Um, <laughs> but 
there's, ma there's managers you know you've been in a game with. One of the most difficult places I went to where I really felt brutalised when I first went there was Sheffield United. I really found Bramall Lane a difficult place to go to. And I remember at the beginning of um, the game when they play that song that booms out. You lift up my sense. Should we do like a sing song here? <laughs> You've got the mic there if you want to. <laughs> um, yeah, I remember that sort of coming out and everyone looking around bewildered. The game's kicked off and this, this song's still playing in the background. And I remember the first time I won there, that as we opened our dressing room door, we played that song out into the tunnel. And I remember the Sheffield United players looking around and it was like our way of just saying, we're ready. Like we, we know this place, we know you work, we're ready. And we went and won that day. We, Martin Samuelson scored a late goal for us to win 3-2 when I was at Peterborough. And so I like, I like, like the challenge of managing against clubs, managing against managers, managing against opposition players. Um, you know, you get, yeah, all sorts of stuff goes on. In, you, you don't need me to tell you what goes on in the game between players, between managers, between clubs. It's, that's why we've all been a part of it in one way or another across the course of time, eh? I think we mentioned before, before well, before we started, that I think we're on th epi like 300 episodes now as well. And I think we can be guilty sometimes of taking our foot off the gas. You're that so. flea that keeps it in yeah. fucking, not but hitting top. Would there be after See, today? I've taught, you, I've taught you something today. <laughs> yeah. After I like today's that. Part, I, I, I like that. You actually, you actually did that at Newport when I were in the dressing room. Did I? Yeah. Yeah, correct. Well, after today's Is that your way of saying I'm boring you? <laughs> <laughs> After today's performance, I don't know, is there a, is there a kind of a, a team talk that you give us or that could really motivate us to perform better in the future? You want observations? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, really, really to give us... You we know, want a team talk. Well, Perkins up. you know Clough liked a goalkeeper, a centre-half and a centre-forward. I think you've got a nice balance. I don't think you've... You're not all the same, are you, as people? I think you're... Um, you're hard hitting with your questions, as in you go after the you go after what you want to go after. Um, I'd like to think in a respectful way, though. I was just going to say you go after what you want to go after, but you go after it in a friendly way, and um, between you all, you make it comfortable for people to talk to you, which is why I guess people do talk to you. So um, I think you I think you're doing a really good job, and I, I'm sure that you'll be um, I'm sure that you'll be learning all the time about ways of going about it differently and better, but you're not succeeding because you haven't got any balance here. You've got a, a goalkeeper, a centre-half, a centre-forward. <laughs> <laughs> one, one softens you up, the other one comes in a little bit. Like... I was hoping for a rocket, to be honest. I wanted you to burn it all in us, give us a bit of uh, oomph. Kick up the one. arse. No, no. I, <laughs> and and do you know what as well? In the background, you've got camera and lights going on. Very quiet and professional and like it's like the in the back every great team's got a good back room as well and if you've got a nice back room sorting things out behind the scenes you've got good personalities in front of the scenes likeable people go about their work though good formula it's been fun thank you very, thank you very much well done Matty <laughs> you're that you're our fleet we'll just, just carry on just rock it up <laughs> <laughs>
by the way, hat trick for the corduroy. Yeah. Yeah. I won't even. I, it was in my head. I thought I, I, you were beeping outside that picked me up. And I thought, I need a jacket. And then I thought, I can't take that again. And then I just thought, oh, fuck it. I'll take so to it. be fair, for the I'll first 12 of the 15 shows, you wore that other thing, didn't it? The orange thing. The orange one. Yeah. Yeah, so we're in Blackpool. Back out. We're yeah, in Blackpool. Yeah, we've not said where we are. Dig it back out. Yeah. Have we still got but it? From yeah, the tip. It's wardrobe. <laughs> no. Bit of Febreze, it'll be right at that. Fucking <laughs> hellfire. That, that's so to get through customs that with quarantine, I'm telling you. <laughs> I think you're going through an image change. Yeah. Right. You're going to, like, with the glasses on his T-shirt and that. Yeah. My glasses so are back. Sophisticated. Glasses are back. Do you know... Um, it's not turning big time, is he? I've lost my glasses. No, I've lost my glasses in Qatar, if you remember. I've not, I've not got any since and I can't see. <laughs> so <laughs> I've got my glasses. Finally got them. Are they proper left, glasses or fashion? Proper glasses. Oh. I, left them in a, I left them in taxi in Qatar. What, and you haven't worn them since? No. But then I was getting some food over there, and I, I was like, I had to go right up to the counter, to read the menu. On the kebab house? Yeah. <laughs> 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 look at it, oh, fuck it, I'll have number 73, please. You look like you've lost some timber again. Have you been trying? No, we went gym. We've not, had a, we've not been recording, have we, so... Well, I lost out, lads. You've just been away. The mucky and all, like... The, Stay like, high. Yeah, can you see? Smudges and like, that. like a four-year-old. <laughs> like it's foggy, isn't it? like... I genuinely thought we're, on, like, we're backstage here at Blackpool, and I think they've turned smoke screen machine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we didn't, we've not finished the sentence yet. We're in the uh, this is this is show business. Mm -hmm. There's no business like show. Look at the. Uh, can we have a pan and have a look at some of the fancy that. dress? That yes. Now we're talking. Like a circus master. It doesn't smell the best. Has it been made, has it been <laughs> made, has it been made for you, though? <laughs> <laughs> I think it has. <laughs> you need a top hat. It suits you. you like him on the uh, greatest well. show, man. You just need a yeah. big elf or something behind, or a big lion or something. Anyway, a big announcement. Under the cosh announcement, because you it's been a, a big holiday for you, this one, hasn't it? Oh, fuck me, yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. you want to talk, talk, talk us yeah, through talk it? Us step through by this. step. I lost two pound. <laughs> 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 uh, well, I've got to, uh, I've decided to make somebody a fucking lottery winner, ain't I? And she is a lottery winner, isn't she? Oh, she, yeah. She fucking is not a... <laughs> so you, she said yes? She said yes. Was I... there any hesitation? I've never, I thought we were getting Jason punching on when, <laughs> off his balls because it was just... Loads and loads of pictures of Jason Punchin. <laughs> I know, I'll tell you what, by the way. I, I, I know I know, I'm ugly, right? <laughs> but fuck me, I didn't think I was that ugly. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I, like, fucking hell. Fucking Punchin, Punchin, Jason Punchin. Punchin. Hey, I saw a video the other day, but you'd rather that than somebody be pulling you to one side and saying... Oh, she's, she's, be fair, she's disgusting. She's I, think, I think it's <laughs> the... That's what her pals have done since we've been back. <laughs> are you sure? He's a fucking fat cunt. His, his hair's dropping out. His teeth are all over the shop. And he's only going to get bigger. <laughs> so you don't get nervous normally, do you? But I'm, this is a different level, isn't it? Sorry, Chris. <laughs> I've been talking about invading someone's face. You're practically kicking me off couch. Well, you're, um, I were a little bit nervous, yeah. Not not for uh, saying yeah. I knew... Oh, it's given, isn't it? Given. <laughs> She's, She's not made of wood, is she? Uh, eh? she <laughs> She's not made of wood. No. Uh, but yeah, I was a bit nervous because, first of all, getting ring through customs, her case got checked. Yeah, right, so I'm thinking, oh, I hope mine don't get checked because obviously it's in there. On that front, would you have to word the, you'd have to word the fella up, wouldn't you, and say, listen, mate. Right, I know, but why she stood next to me? You both stand next to each other, don't you? You know, in the, yeah. get, put it in the tray. Um, so we. So uh, I, I was a little bit nervous, just I wanted it to go all right, like. We pissed? Too pissed, I. Uh, <laughs> As we know, there's a line, isn't there, with you? Yeah. <laughs> how, but, many, how many How many? did you add? So uh, I probably had four or five round pool, right, and then went back to to, hotel, uh, to apartment to get changed and that, and I, and I got four cans for while she were getting ready, and they went and all. So you were eight deep, at eight, least. Eight deep, and uh, then, I think you'll testify at three. Three. He's starting. The, the, you know, that, that, sales well, are flapping at three. But we didn't go to the restaurant until ten. We got uh, half eight. So I, I bet played, you were starving, were you? Played, oh, it's pecky shy. <laughs> but I've, uh, I played another two or three. So I'll probably in for ten. And when did you do it? 
Did you have starters, mains, and desserts? No, no. I, I shit my pants. Then I got excited. How did you do it? After did you, the starter, you just, put it on. I just, took, just like fucking on this. Put it, did you put it in a pie? Uh, <laughs> We're in a nice restaurant. We're in a fucking pie and chip shop. That's it, though. You want to enjoy your food. You don't want to be like nervous. Yeah, I, I, pie I, and enjoy, chips. I can't remember eating my main meal. Can't so you went after it. main? No, after starter. Oh, after starter? Yeah. Right. After Sorry, starter. That. We are talking stag do's on the way over. Oh, yeah. You're not invited. Yeah, under no fucking <laughs> circumstances. Good. <laughs> Good. No, uh, to be fair, I think I'm just going to stick to what I know. Better Dom. Benny Dom. <laughs> Everyone's Never in- change your winning team. Everybody's, invi- again. <laughs> Everybody's invited. I'll let you know dates. <laughs> Everybody. <laughs> Patreons. <laughs> Who would a Patreon stag do? <laughs> I don't want to have to buy a drink. Fuck it. Can we do... Look, let's have a Patreon raffle. <laughs> what? <laughs> to go to his wedding? <laughs> stag do. Go to his stag do. That's not a bad shout, <laughs> that, you know. Uh, so, yeah, so I'm officially engaged. Well, yeah, congr- well, congratulations. I'm not doing it again. After this one, you said that. Yeah, you definitely said it. You definitely said it last time. But yeah, that's my news. Congratulations! I don't think I did lose two pound on holiday. By the way, were you all inclusive? No, no apartment. You're looking tanned. I tell you what, he is looking, Chris. The tan line is a bit high. Have you noticed? I've not noticed. Let's have a butcher. Have a look. Yeah, I don't. Great. So it's like an inch above the hip. So these are my baked beans. Yeah, my jeans are here. Do they look high? No, they look mm. all right. They look all right. And my tan line's there. Just lift the first uh, fold, fold up. up. Yeah. <laughs> no, oh, there, look. It's just probably... It is high. Well, I don't know. Three centimetres? Maybe because you've got an eye belly button. I've got, I, I, I have got an eye belly button between my nipples. But I don't know. See, I can't wear my shorts there, can I? Because that's my bum bone. I thought you were going to say bum bum then. Come here. Let's see. Turn around. See, it rises. Oh, no. Oh, he's if, in right you go around the, he's yeah, in right truck, because look where his crack finishes. So, so, so if he goes any lower, he's, yeah. he's going to be King Peach. Yeah, though. you're right. I think I'm just a funny shape, lad. Mm-hmm. I know it's that in Qatar that you do wear them. The, the look high. Lump, bumpy. Probably like deceiving. Lumpy and bumpy. Let's go that Let's go that second one, not the third one. I'll not be able to breathe. <laughs> so, yeah, we've got the uh, Blackpool show. It's almost curtains, lads. Nervous? Yeah. Nah, Carlton's on his way, isn't he? Wrexham, two weeks. Wrexham in two weeks, if you fancy coming to that. There's uh, still some tickets available. Glenn Little. Glenn Little. I wonder if he knows I used to play football yet. That's I'll let, we'll let him know I'll, before. Oh, Come yeah, on. we'll let him know on introduction. I heard Glenn. Former footballer, Chris Brown. I heard Glenn, this, <laughs> I heard Glenn, this is Chris. Uh, yeah, Sunderland, Norwich, Preston, Donny. Blackpool, uh, Blackburn. I actually scored in the same game as him. I know I keep saying it. Can you tell it hurts? Yeah. 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 Anyway. And uh, obviously we mentioned fair play before. If you want to get involved, we've got that uh, big international game, England versus Australia. We're seeing 5-0. So all you've got to do is sign up using the link in the description, deposit a fiver, and then you'll get a £5 free bet that you can bet against us that England are going to win five by five goals. So we think they're going to win five yeah. by five goals. So if goals. they don't, you're going to win a fiver. It's a free basically. fiver, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I was more confident the other day than I am now. We, I mean, we were confident when we were talking about it, but yeah. I'm so not, so, so if, you do, if you put a fiver in, bet your fiver that England are not going to win by five so goals. You put your fiver in and then you get, fair play will give you a fiver to bet against us. Right. So there's every chance you're going to get a tenner. I tell you what, if they do win by five nil, that stag dude's uh, going to Vegas, baby. We not. Fuck, I can't do that no more. <laughs> is it? Is it on the shortlist, Vegas? Yeah, very short. I can't do it. You know, I can't do it. I'm two days and done. Hmm. Just a long way for two days for me. I know, but me and Chris will enjoy it. He's crapper than me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so get involved. Five or yes. in. Links in the description. Um, get yourself involved, like you said. Who's next week? We don't know yet. I don't think there's any difference in like the actual glass bit. Are you short sighted or long sighted? It's for up close and personal. What did you order by the way? Look, at, look how big that is. <laughs> <hell fire. laughs> no wonder she said yeah. <laughs> how would you put an extra loop in your belt? What what utensil do you use? I don't have to. What, for an extra doll? We've all done it the way. <laughs> John's not put an all in a belt for since he were at school. There's uh, a few spare on there though. In your defence. What do you use for getting all in that? About a 12 gauge. <laughs> it, is a, it is a metre and a half belt, this, you know. 
<laughs> anyway, let's, let's crack uh, up. Yeah, get yourself involved. Links in the description. I'm just about to do it again, so let's get him in. Thanks for watching, as always. Yeah, thank you very much. See you next week. Here we go, chaps. Moment of truth. The man has arrived. Showtime! <laughs> Money's in the pot. Show me the money, lads! Show me the fucking money!